Hi, I'm Reverend Amy. Thanks for joining us. This week we start a new worship series for the month of October. And today is a very special day, St. Francis Day. St. Francis was a 12th century Italian friar. He is known as the patron, patron saint of animals. There are many stories about St. Francis's life. He preached to birds and befriended a wolf terrorizing a village. We often remember this day by a blessing of the animals. How interesting that we bless the creatures that are already such a blessing to us. I think they already come to us blessed. Our pets are beloved members of our families. We thank God for such loving companions, especially during the pandemic. So many animals have really cared for us as we care for them. So let's take a deep breath and center ourselves as we prepare to worship God. May we remember that God created. May we remember that God liberated. May we remember that God fed. May we remember that God is still creating, God is still liberating, and God is still feeding us. Let this be our story. Let this be where we begin. Let us worship Holy God.
calls us to remember that creation was made good and Sabbath is necessary. The story of God calls us to remember that we belong to one another, for we are bone of bone and flesh of flesh. The story of God calls us to remember that reconciliation between siblings is holy and slavery of any kind is evil. The story of God calls us to remember that the wilderness is real, that the God will be with us at all times, raining down manna and speaking in a still, small voice. The story of God calls us to remember that love looks like healing the sick, eating with the outcasts, making room for the children, and seeing the unseen. The story of God calls us to remember, because if we forget, we risk making God, love, and reconciliation small. So, as we remember, may we declare we believe in a God who made all things good who stands with the suffering, walks with us in the wilderness, sees the overwhelmed, loves with an untamed heart, and makes room for all at God's table. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, friends. I'm so glad you could join us here again today. This week, I have been thinking about what it means to have enough. Have you ever worried that you would run out of something? Or have you ever run out of food and been hungry? Did you ask for help to get more? Who did you ask for help? Our story this week is about Moses. And it's a story which we could retitle, When Moses Took the Israelites on the Worst Camping Trip Ever. Have you ever gone camping? Well, did you pack food for your camping trip? When we go camping, we usually take enough food with us to last the whole time we're away from home. But if we run out of food, we can usually find a local grocery store or restaurant to eat. Well, the Israelites lived in Egypt, where they had plenty of food available. Maybe they didn't have a grocery store, but they probably could have gone to a marketplace to get some more groceries or food when they were hungry. But when Moses took the Israelites on their trip to the Promised Land, they were in the desert. What do you know about the desert? Well, it's hot and it's dry, and not a lot of food grows in the desert. So, the Israelites didn't have much food, and eventually they started to get hungry and worried that they wouldn't have enough food. When you're hungry or worried that you don't have enough to eat, who do you complain to? At my house, when my kids don't think we have enough of the food that they like, they complain to me. Well, the Israelites complained to Moses about not having enough food, and Moses complained, or he prayed, to God. He told them that the Israelites were running out of food and they were worried. Do you know what God did for the Israelites? He sent manna from heaven. He sent enough bread so that all of the Israelites could eat and not be hungry or worried anymore. He didn't send them an all-you-can-eat buffet, but he did make sure that there was something for everyone that day. Sometimes when we worry we won't have enough, who do you complain to? Did you ever pray to God that he would send you food so you wouldn't go hungry? I'd like to tell you one of my favorite stories. It has a very happy ending. It's about a time when God used me and my friends to help other people who were worried that they wouldn't have enough. In my house, we call this the Great Christmas Cookie Miracle Story. 
It happened a few years ago when the quilt guild I belong to had its annual holiday party in December. We celebrate the holiday season every year with something called a Christmas cookie social. All of the members come and bring their own homemade Christmas cookies to share with everyone. And there are tons and tons and tons of the most delicious cookies you have ever eaten. There are so many cookies that even after sharing them with everyone and everyone making a plate to take home to share with their families, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of cookies left over. Well, on this day, it was my job to clean up after the meeting and decide where to bring the cookies. We packed them all up in big boxes and we planned to take them to Albany to the Capital City Rescue Mission. That is a very special place in Albany that makes free meals for people every day in Albany. It gives these meals to hundreds of men and women who are hungry. So on that day, after school, I grabbed my son Daniel and we headed over to the city mission. When we arrived at the front door, they told us to take the boxes of cookies right into the cafeteria. As we walked through the door, the head chef welcomed us. When, he, when we told him we had dozens of cookies, he started to smile and laugh. And as he pointed out to where we could put the boxes, he, he turned to another man working in the room and he said, still smiling and laughing, I told you we would have enough. And then he turned to me and he said, he was worried that we wouldn't have enough cookies for everyone tonight. Thank you for bringing these. As we walked out of that cafeteria, Daniel and I couldn't stop smiling. Daniel asked me, mom, did you hear what he said? Do you know what we did? It was a Christmas cookie miracle. And it was. Just by sharing our leftovers, we were able to bring a smile to these men's faces and to bring some cookies to men and women who probably had, had no plans for a good homemade cookie that day. The end. That's the f my favorite story. We may not know how God is going to help us or who he'll use, but when we ask for help because we don't have enough, God will provide. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making sure we have enough. Thank you for letting us help others when they are in need. Please remind us to look for those who need you and let us be your hands and feet on earth. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Sunday school lesson for this week is called Manna from Heaven. And you will find that at sundayschoolresources.com. It's from Exodus chapter, chapter 16. And you can also find the link below in our YouTube comments. In the meantime, welcome to October. Can you believe it's fall? I hope you have a great week and I will see you again here next Sunday. Bye. Apprehend God in all things, for God is in all things. Every single creature is full of God and is a book about God. Every creature is a word of God. If I spent enough time with the tiniest creature, even a caterpillar, I would never have to prepare a sermon. So full of God is every creature. All right now, let's pray. Beloved creatures, you were created by God and you are loved by God. May you and your human family experience joy and companionship together and continue to be a blessing to each other. In the name of the Creator, the Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, look, a squirrel. There's animals and animals and animals and animals and animals and animals and animals. And animals, and animals. Yes, Lord, the animals are coming one by one. The old cat chewing on the caraway bun. The animals are coming two by two. The elephant and the kangaroo. The animals are coming three by three. The bear and the bug and the bumblebee. All the animals are coming four by four. The old hippopotamus stuck in the door. The animals are coming five by five. Thus the animals did arrive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
hallelujah, hallelujah to the lamb. Oh, the animals are coming, six by six. The hyena laughing at the monkey's tricks. The animals are coming, seven by seven. The old fat pig says, who's that shivin'? The animals are coming, eight by eight. Noah hollered out, shut that gate. Oh, the animals are coming, nine by nine. Noah hollered out, cut that line. Oh, the animals are coming, ten by ten. The old oh, oh, it's whistled and Nobody knew where they was at till the Yakum Bumpanera rat. Hallelujah, 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 The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam and Israel, came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread, and then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It's the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. The stories of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness are among my favorite Bible stories. In this time of pandemic, these are rich stories to turn to, even more so when I think of the struggles of the generations that have come before us, and how they too have turned to draw wisdom from the deep well of wisdom these stories provide. There have been a lot of wilderness wanderings throughout human history. And when we turn to these stories, we see that God is not silent. God is very active. I know that sometimes it feels as if God is silent when we struggle. 
One of the things that is repeated in this story is that God listens to the people's complaints. God is a good listener, an active listener. God listens and responds. God tells Moses to tell the people, draw near to me your God because I have heard your complaints. Well, isn't that a dream come true? We have a God who listens even to our complaints. I've noticed lately that when people ask, how, how are you? I respond, I can't complain. It seems like a good answer to give that's a lot less long-winded than my actual real answer would be. And it's true, I can't complain. I have more, we have more than many people do, especially in these COVID times. Having our health, a job, food and housing, many of us can't complain. Perhaps I can't complain should be changed to I won't complain because we certainly are very skilled at complaining. We are great at it. We've been practicing and honing this skill for a very long time. The Israelites who were once slaves debated the merits of going back to slavery in Egypt because the food was better there. Better than the food that God provided twice a day. The Israelites complain, and what does God do? God still provides quail at night and manna fresh each morning. When people gather it, they gather different amounts. We know this still happens. Some end up with a lot. Some end up with very little in life. But when they measured it out, it was all the same enough. That says a lot about people but it says a whole lot more about God. Despite our best efforts, or even our lousy efforts, God still provides for us, making sure that there is really enough to go around. Maybe it is God who provides, and we are in charge of the gathering and sharing. That's food for thought. After all, the Israelites didn't lay on the wilderness ground and expect God to feed them with a spoon. They had to do the work of collecting the manna every day. And isn't that the work of the church? To remember that there is enough? Just about everything in our world tells us that there isn't enough. Not enough money, prestige, our bodies aren't enough, our homes, children, spouses, careers, nothing is good enough. We always come up lacking. In a consumeristic society, that's the way things roll and we see that they often roll right over people. But isn't that the role of the church to be a balm, to bring some healing to this not enough predisposition? It reminds me of that old hackneyed preacher's joke. A preacher says there's not enough money in the collection plate for the bills, but there's good news and bad news. The good news is that we have the money, but the bad news is that it's in your wallet. It's our work as a church to remember that there is enough. It is among us. It's our work to remember that God provides, God always has provided, and God will keep on doing it. And to remember that we need to be involved. We are the distribution center. We're the hands and feet, the generous hearts. We share what we have. As we've been working on reopening our sales in the church under the church's COVID safety plan, you can see people gearing up to get ready to share. Granted, a lot of sharing has been going on even when we're closed, but we're moving into a new phase. A lot of people have been hard hit by the virus's economic impact. We'll share household items and clothes. We'll share some smiles, even though they'll be under masks. And we'll work together, which is a huge part of helping us all to remember that there is enough. There really only is enough when we work together. We have a God who listens to us, even our complaints. We have a God who loves us and provides abundantly for us. Let's come together to share God's love and blessings so that truly all may have enough.
This reading is from Luke chapter 22. Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them. They were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began to look for an opportunity to betray him to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us that we may eat it. They asked him, where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them. When you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the, the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as he had told them and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going, as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another, which one of them it could be who would do this? Betrayal. We all know this story, and sadly, we still see or experience betrayals in our daily lives today. At work, at home, with friends, maybe even here at Del Mar Methodist. I've been a member here over 20 years, and have seen many people come and go. That comes with being an usher, among other roles at our church. Sometimes it's a mystery why certain people have left. Often these people were active in the church and came to worship regularly. Then they were gone. My thought is that they may have felt betrayed in some way, maybe by someone they loved or were friends with or that they trusted. And the pain was so great that they chose to move on and take their gifts elsewhere. I have a hunch that feelings of betrayal are common in church settings because we're there to do good, not to earn a paycheck or entertain ourselves or any number of other things. We can be very invested spiritually and emotionally. And when we try to do good and we get hurt, the pain can be very intense. I myself felt a bit betrayed on occasion at church, but I won't go into details here since these are very minor blemishes to a wonderful spiritual growth experience that I've enjoyed with my family over many years. And if I just have a few minor gripes that I'm really quite fortunate compared to those in our congregation and beyond who constantly suffer prejudice about their race, gender, age, sexual orientation, and so on. 
Pam and I have stuck around Delmar Methodist and have pledged faithfully to the church each November. So why haven't we packed up our bags and headed elsewhere or nowhere? I suppose because of the simple recognition that we're all human here. We try to live a Christian life, but we make mistakes. And unfortunately, we often have no idea how our words and actions are perceived by others. And of course, the many wonderful things that happen here far outweigh any negatives. But in any event, it's of course not just about all of us. Consider our reading from Luke, which I believe ultimately is about God's love for everyone. Judas betrayed Jesus in exchange for money, but was still invited to the table. Jesus was not interested in punishing Judas. Quite the opposite, he wanted to find a way to bring him back. What an enormous challenge that offers us to not seek revenge, to not walk away, to not stop giving of ourselves. God's love for us is steadfast in good times and in bad. He does not betray us. Amen. Gracious God, as we come to you today in prayer, we admit that giving is complicated. At times, it is easier to remember our shame or guilt around giving, as opposed to your joy or generosity. We all have our money narratives, and they affect us in different ways. So today, as we offer our gifts to you, we pray that you would recenter our narrative. Remind us that we do not give out of shame or guilt. We do not give out of obligation. We do not give to feel worthy, and we do not give to buy your grace. We give out of a desire to participate. We give as a sign of gratitude. We give because we belong to one another. We give to build a more just and equitable world. We give because we love, and that's what love does. So take these gifts and remind us that we belong to one another. Remind us that all money narratives are welcome at this table. Remind us that whatever shame or guilt we bring with us will be washed away with your empathy and love. Remind us and then help us to build that more beautiful world. In hope we pray. Amen. My first memory of money was seeing my mother put money in the church envelope each week on payday. And this was during the Depression. I always, before the pandemic, gave once a week, too, in her honor. Blessings, Connie Tilrow. My first job was vacuuming my dad's office when I was a little girl. My dad's CPA practice was up a very steep flight of stairs in an old building. I think I was paid a quarter, which was pretty exciting. Child labor was a value back then, I guess. I still remember how the heavy, awkward, upright vacuum cleaner smelled warm and clicked menacingly as I vacuumed up staples. After I was done vacuuming, I sat on Dad's lap at his huge desk and tried out his adding machine, which he could use without looking at his fingers. I drew pictures on the back of old tax return forms. Dad taught me how to read the stock pages in the Wall Street Journal and told me to save so I could invest my quarter someday. Lord of justice and mercy, we quibble over perceived little injustices. 
We look around us and see mercy being offered to others when we feel that they have done little to merit such treatment. Our world is in such bad shape. There are true injustices and horrible situations in which peace and mercy seem to be dim and distant hopes. Give us eyes to see where justice and compassion may be offered. Give us hearts to reach out to those who are new in faith and struggle in life. Enable and strengthen each one of us in your service that we may offer peace and hope to others, not counting the cost, but sharing the wealth of your mercy and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let us continue in prayer, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Dios a la esperanza danos hoy soy paz. Al mundo en crisis habla tu verdad. Dios de la justicia manda nos tu luz. Luz y esperanza en la oscuridad. Oremos por la paz, cantemos oh, tu amor, luchemos por la paz, fieles a ti, Señor. Me de cada poco with us every day, filling all our lives with love and joy and peace. Me de God of justice speed us on our way. Bringing light and hope to every land and race. Praying, let us work for peace. Singing, share our joy with all. Working for a world that's new. Faithful when we hear Christ call. Go in the peace of Christ. Remember that despite our complaints, God loves us and feeds us. Remember that even in the depths of betrayal, we are invited to the table. In desperation and in times of betrayal, we are gifted with God's provisions and love. Because we have known this grace, may we go out to share this love and seek God's justice for all. Go in peace. Amen.
Thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you here again next week. In celebration of St. Francis, I leave you with his words in his well-beloved prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Have a good week. Bye.